Yeah, that looks like something happened. Something changed. Yeah, it says recording the call. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, hello, friends and comrades. Welcome to another edition of uh, One Plus One, your place for inconvenient truth telling and myth busting. And we are joined by, by, in my opinion, arguably one of the finest journalists, media critics, and NGO critics of this millennial generation. We are joined by Rania uh, Kalik. Uh, Rania, who was a uh, former contributor to uh, Alternet, she contributes to the Gray Zone. She's a co-host of uh, Left Bitches. She does her own uh, media critic videos, uh, part of Soapbox, co-host of Unauthorized Disclosure with Kevin uh, Gostola. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking all about Syria, but all sorts of other topics. But Rania, you're also part of a uh, new uh, me uh, of, of a new journalism group, right? Yes, I recently, just last week was my first week. I am a journalist for Breakthrough News. Uh, yeah. which I recommend to everybody who's watching go check out. We have a YouTube channel, we're on Instagram and Twitter, and it's a really great cast of amazing uh, people putting together uh, journalistic content for the left. So I'm really excited to be a part of it. <laughs> and yeah. thank you for the lovely introduction. Oh, you're you're very welcome. I've been I've been I've been wanting I've been wanting to interview you for ages, even when I was briefly Aww. associated with Black Agenda Reports. Uh, I remember like say I remember off volunteering to uh, Glenn Ford, the executive editor, saying, "Can I go interview a bunch of people and it be published at Black Agenda Report?" And then Mr. <laughs> Ford was like, "Yeah, sure, right ahead." And I remember, okay, email Ronnie Akalik, email Ronnie Akalik, <laughs> but. But, but yes, but now I finally have you on my own uh, program, so that's so that's just brilliant. And then before, oh yeah, then oh I also forgot to mention, Rania was also a uh, media critic of uh, fairness and accuracy in reporting. That's how I actually discovered her work uh, oh. when it came to uh, Syria, Venezuela, and so forth. And she also was a, a correspondent at times for the Real News Network. So that is correct. Thank you. I appreciate. <laughs> so, I appreciate all that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and yes, and she is, and yet, yeah, and she is Lebanese American, uh, but and uh, based in uh, Beirut. So, Rania. So, the first question then I wanted to uh, ask you, and uh, you, you know, sorry if it's a very repetitive question, but but basically, you know, if you could talk to anyone, if you were a journalism professor, a history professor, or if you had. You know, uh, or or if you you know could go on the democracy nows of the world and you explain to people how the situation in Syria broke out, how would you explain it? It's a great question. Um, so I guess to really simplify it, I would explain it as you know, Syria is a complex country with a lot of its own internal problems, and in 2011, as was happening in other parts of the Middle East, there was people who were very inspired by seeing protests in Egypt and Tunisia, who, you know, started protesting in Syria as well um, for, for like more political freedoms. That was, you know, there was protests that took place in Syria that were, you know, by good liberals and progressive types. Um, but, you know, everybody looks at Syria as a place where that's all that happened, was just protests for democracy broke out. But that's yeah. not exactly how it went down. There was protests, not all of Syria is the same. There was protests in the cities, and there was very different kind of protests in some of the more rural conservative areas that had a very different agenda. And those, those protests had a, had a much more sectarian flavor to them um, and had their history in the ongoing feud between the Syrian government and the Muslim Brotherhood that goes back decades. Um, and so Syria wasn't just one kind of, people call it a revolution. I think the proper term is to say there was an uprising in Syria and it was multifaceted, uh, depending on which area you were in, the, in geographically across the country, the ideology was different. And the US saw an opportunity, the US and its Gulf state allies saw an opportunity in these protests to basically fund and arm the conservative elements that were protesting in Syria. Yeah. And that very, very quickly turned into hardened jihadist groups fighting the Syrian government. Um, yeah. And that is not to like, uh, you know, people hear that and they're like, oh, you're just absolving the Syrian government for behaving badly. But what yeah. happened in Syria was much more complicated than one side protested and the other side shot them. You know, yeah. it was two people, it was two sides fighting. Um, and one of those sides received a great deal of support for many, many years, for seven or eight years, 
from the U.S. and its Gulf state allies and Tur- you know, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia uh, to try and use this uprising to overthrow the Syrian government. And it fractured and destroyed Syria in many, many ways. And, you know, that part of the war, the arming and funding of, of jihadist groups to try and collapse the Syrian government, that part of the yeah. war has largely passed. These Gulf state actors in the U.S. are no longer arming and funding these, these jihadist groups. What they're doing now instead is they've shifted from a hot war of proxy fighting to an economic war where they've basically besieged all of Syria. Um, And they've applied these horrible, crippling, murderous sanctions that are denying average Syrians access to fuel, to, you know, uh, to have electricity in the wintertime uh, when it's very, very cold, are denying Syrians access to uh, certain medicines and certain, uh, you know, it, it goes beyond that even. Like y- when there's sanctions imposed on a country the way they have been on Syria, it also makes it difficult for people to get replacement parts for important machinery, like a dialysis machine in a hospital, for example, because yeah. those replacement parts are manufactured outside of the country. And because of sanctions, you can't purchase them. It's also devalued the Syrian currency and pretty much destroyed the economy. So people's salaries now in Syria are worthless, and the government has almost no money. I know you asked me for a very simple answer. Yeah, no, 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 guess, no, 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 yeah. no. That's all very important. That's all very important. Continue. Yeah. So just to say, like this, this, this war against Syria is ongoing, um, and now it's in the form of what I would call economic terrorism. Um, Syrians are being denied, you know, after ten years of war. That was one of the biggest covert programs in U.S. history to arm and fund these jihadist groups. After 10 years of that destruction, you have the U.S. and its allies imposing these sanctions on Syria that are denying it the capacity to even rebuild what was destroyed. So basically uh, sanctioning anyone who attempts to do business with any sort of aspect of the Syrian government that wants to do reconstruction. That's like that you will you will be fined. You will yeah. have financial like uh, p- uh, penalties if you do that. These sanctions actually go even further in the sense of um, parties in, in Lebanon and Iraq, Syria's neighbors, are subject to sanctions if they do business with their neighbor, Syria. So that basically cuts Syria off from being able to trade with its neighbors. It would be like if China were to impose sanctions on America and then financially penalize anybody in Canada or Mexico who wanted to do business with America. Um, So they're really, this is like a medieval siege that the U.S. has imposed on Syria. And it's not, you know, the government that's suffering. The government is suffering as a result. But far more is the people of Syria who are suffering. The vast majority of Syrians live in these government areas. And, you know, it goes even beyond the sanctions because the U.S., and its ally Turkey are actually occupying big parts of Syria. Turkey yeah. is occupying uh, areas in the north, Idlib, and then, of course, Afrin, which it took two years ago in a very violent uh, a fight that the U.S. did nothing to stop uh, that got a lot of attention. Um, so Syria is occupying northern Syria. And then you have the U.S. occupying wait, uh, you, mean, wait, you mean you mean Turkey's occupying northern yeah, Syria? Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Turkey. Yeah. Turkey is occupying northern Syria. And and its proxies, right? So like the former Al-Qaeda group, which is now called Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, is basically the one administering authority over Idlib under the sort of like auspices of the Turkish military. Um, and then you have uh, the U.S. role in basically using its proxy, this the... Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, which is really just the YPG rebranded. The YPG is the Syrian branch of the Turkish PKK. All these acronyms I know get very confusing. But just to know that, you know, this is the Kurdish group that you hear a lot about. The U.S. is basically arming and funding this Kurdish group that it calls the SDF to maintain control over this area in northeast Syria that happens to be situated in one of the most fertile areas of the country. So this is the breadbasket of Syria. This is where wheat is grown. This is also where Syria's oil is. So so these Syrian oil fields and the most fertile land in the country is now under uh, the control of these U.S.-backed forces. As the U.S. military is there, there's about 2,500 or so U.S. military uh, personnel there to oversee this occupation. And so as a result, as Syria is under these crippling sanctions, um, they're denied access to their own oil and own wheat. They have to actually buy it back. 
from the SDF. And then because of U.S. sanctions devaluing the Syrian cur currency uh, so ter like so terribly, Syria doesn't even actually have the hard currency to purchase back its own oil and wheat. So there are wheat shortages and bread shortages, and there's fuel shortages in a country that is located in one of the, oil, the most oil-rich regions of the world. That's not natural, you know? That's by, des that's by design of the U.S. empire. And so this is, you know, it's very hard for Americans to wrap their heads around what sanctions mean for a country because sanctions is such a cold, uh, unemotional term, and it doesn't elicit the, the, the emotions you get from war or like bombing. Yeah. Um, but it actually is just as, if not more devastating. You know, I have, I know a lot of people in Syria. I've been to Syria many times. I've been reporting, I've reported from Syria over the last five, four or five years. And, and I know people who have stayed there all this time. And they will tell you what's taking place right now, living under this financial ruin, these sanctions, this lack of any sort of economically viable future or like access to the outside world is actually more suffocating uh, and more hopeless for them than when there was actual fighting. It's that old, it's kind of, it's it's kind of like what Gandhi once said that poverty is the worst form of, of violence is the most like vile form of violence is that space that's basically what's happening to Syria kind of like what the uh, kind of like when Alfred Desaias spoke out against the sanctions on Venezuela or when John Pilger uh, did that documentary about the monstrous sanctions of mass destruction on Iraq in the 90s after the first Gulf War, right? Is that basically what's happening in Syria? I mean, yes, actually, that's a great comparison because, you know, and it's interesting because the sanctions on Iraq uh, took place throughout the 90s, right after the first Gulf War. Um, and the sanctions were really meant to soften the country up for the invasion that came later. With Syria, it's like the other way around. You have this decade long uh, destruction of the country that didn't work. The U.S. didn't get what it wanted. It didn't get the regime change that it wanted because these yeah. bigger actors like Russia, right, um, and Iran. You were and legally Zola invited and Lebanon, to come into the country. Yes. Right. Which yeah. is a big difference, right, that, the U, that nobody likes to emphasize in America. But the Syrian government invited them to come intervene uh, because had they not intervened, had nobody wants to say this out loud, had yeah. Russia and Iran and Hezbollah not intervened, particularly especially Russia, you might have seen the black flag of ISIS flying over Damascus. Um, and that was the U.S.'s fault that ISIS was even in Syria to begin with. Uh, but that said, you know, um, and, you know, Syria's experienced this decade of war that's really, like, de-developed the country. This was one of the most uh, self-sufficient countries in the Middle East prior to 2011. Syria made its own food. It produced its own medicine. It even made it its own clothes. It had an economy that was self-sufficient. It wasn't perfect. But it was self-sufficient. It had a very high literacy rate, a really great education system. You know, people from Lebanon would go get medical care in Syria because it was affordable and subsidized by the government and it was good medical care. And now, you know, after 10 years of war and now you have these, you know, now you have Syria that it, a lot of the professional class have left, right? The people that you need to make a country successful in a country to function for a healthy society. You need doctors, you need architects, right? You need an educated class of professionals and engineers, right, to make a society function. The, and the war started this process of brain drain from Syria. And, but there were still doctors and engineers and people left, but then with these sanctions, you know, because in people's minds, you know, war has an end. And war doesn't necessarily impact every area of the country. It's not like the entire yeah. country is on fire. It's like there's certain neighborhoods that it's usually isolated to where people are fighting, right? And if you stay away from those neighborhoods, you can get through it. Like there's a way to get through it. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not going to be like this forever. But with economic sanctions, you've really stolen uh, the future away from people. There's no job prospects, right? Like the education sector is, is dying. Teachers are leaving. Um, this is what happened in Iraq in the 90s. The professional class left. And by the time you got to 2003, 2004, there was nobody left. Just the people who couldn't afford to get out. And yeah. that shatters the fabric of a, a society. And I fear that's what we're going to see happening to Syria. You know, because people who are like, 25, 30, they got a decent education in Syria. But what happens to the five-year-olds and 10-year-olds there now?
as you know the education system is crumbling because you know under the weight of 10 years of war and sanctions well that's a perfect that's a perfect segue to why is this massive injustice being allowed to happen and one of the first people i interviewed on on behalf of black agenda reports and later when i started one plus one is uh, Rick Sterling, very criminally underrated uh, journalist mm-hmm. that often is published at uh, Mim Press News and Consortium. And uh, I remember interviewing Rick, and I said, and when I asked Rick the first question, I asked you, and I said, you know, uh, Rania Kalik says that Syria uh, is the is 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 has has been the worst reported story in you know in probably the history of you know american politics so 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 why ha- so 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 yeah so why has so much of the left leaning media jumped the shark on not even just syria i mean china anti russia derangement syndrome venezuela nicaragua <laughs> but specifically on and of course throwing julian assange under the bus i mean people I mean, much of uh, much left leaning media and left leaning groups have completely jumped the shark on Syria. So, yeah, why and why do you think that is people who keep talking about non existent moderate rebels and keep saying, mm-hmm. oh, look, I saw a documentary on Netflix about the white helmets and therefore Assad, Assad must go. Why is that? Uh, you know, why is so much left leaning media and Al Jazeera? We have to talk mm-hmm. about Al Jazeera. Why are they uh, why are they deceiving their audiences on Syria? Yeah, I mean, I think that when it comes to anti-war uh, sentiment and anti-imperialism, you know, there was an understanding that after the Iraq war, there was little appetite among the American populace for more war. So if you want to you're an empire that's dependent on continuing these wars in order to secure markets for ruling elites, in order to secure access to resources, and just maintain hegemony over these different geographic regions of the world. And so if you have, you have to, you know, in a pseudo-democracy like America, where people do vote, right? People do vote. So like, you have to at least, you know, um, soften your population up to accept these kinds of policies on these countries. And so if they have no appetite for invasions, you, you know, you're going to have a billion dollar program to covertly arm and fund these jihadist groups. You better have a good amount of propaganda to justify it, right? Because it might be covert, but it comes out in the media. And so there was a concerted effort uh, to propagandize about what was happening in Syria. And I would say it was probably the first real propag- like war propag- like propaganda war of the like 2000s that was like really utilizing the functions of the internet to confuse people and to convince them of things that weren't actually happening. And you also had this like, you can just look at the amount of money that the US and UK and EU poured into these like media outlets in Syria, right? That were all run by opposition activists operating out of like Gaziantep, Turkey, or out of Beirut, Lebanon. Yeah. Um, you know, or to give like the ability, or to like help fund the, the like basically the media arms of these jihadist groups were like funded and, and trained by US civil society funding from things like, you know, from entities like the, New- the National Endowment for Democracy. And the European Union has like similar parallel organizations that do the same thing. You also had, it wasn't just the US, and you mentioned Al Jazeera. There was always, a, there was also a great deal of Gulf state propaganda that played a huge role in propagandizing the population in the Middle East. Because it was also important to make sure that the Middle Eastern population was at least divided on this issue um, and wasn't supportive of the country of Syria. And so you had Saudi Arabian news outlets. UAE funded news outlets, Qatari funded news outlets like Al Jazeera pushing this line of us, the evil Alawite Assad is trying yeah. to genocide Sunnis, right? And it was just pushing this very Sunni supremacist line that actually started really uh, to take hold back in 2006 uh, when the US and its Gulf state allies actually embarked on a program to try to shift the narrative in the Middle East against Shias in an effort to demonize Iran and to demonize Hezbollah, which had just defeated Israel and became one of the most popular groups in the region amongst, um, across you know, transcending sectarian lines exactly. for, for their role in pushing Israel out of Lebanon in 2006. 
right? They came out really victorious in that. And people were really impressed. And they were, I mean, they were popular in Egypt. They were popular in Iraq. They were popular in Syria. And so that had to stop. And in order to do that, you, you had these Gulf state outlets really shift their narrative towards hatred of minorities, hate, particularly Shias, right? And then you have the same kind of parallel thing happening in the U.S. You, have, you heard this constant demonization of, you know, Shias in Iraq, Shia militia, Shia militia, Shia militias. I remember hearing that like back in, in, in 2010. And I even remember back when like ISIS took over uh, Mosul, initially took over Mosul in Iraq. Uh, there was articles in, in Western news outlets that called ISIS Sunni rebels. They were like Sunni rebels sweep through Mosul. That's how they were portrayed at first. And they portrayed them as Sunni rebels who were angry at the evil Shia government in Iraq. Um, so there was a concerted propaganda effort to demonize the Syrian government uh, to, to the extent of like they don't deserve to be a legitimately recognized government and they don't deserve to have sovereignty. And because, there was because, also, because 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 the line was that uh, is, is that Syria is controlled by an by a small Alawite elite. A, yeah, that's evil, like Alawite sect. Which actually, when you look at it, the Alawites are actually historically like a peasant population in Syria um, that have been historically like repressed by the majority, which is you know the majority across the Middle East has been Sunnis. Um, and so it's the other way around. But of course, you know, they turn that on its head. And but but on top of that, there was the issue. For, and you asked about Western leftists. I, I guess I was talking a little bit more about the Middle East and the role of propaganda there. But exactly in the U.S., you had a um, a real lack of anybody who was actually on the ground in opposition areas. And, it, and the reason for that was because journalists were getting kidnapped. Western journalists were getting kidnapped when they went to Eastern Aleppo and Idlib and they were getting sold to ISIS and then later on beheaded. It wasn't safe because of the people who were in control. But because of that fear of going to those places, Western journalists based in you know Istanbul or Beirut became dependent on these US and Gulf state media outlets inside opposition areas. That's where they were getting all of their news from and it was geared towards them. It was in English for the consumption of these Western reporters. And so they were uncritically taking what they were being told by this active, this activist they're talking to in East Aleppo, who's operating in an area that's under the control of like these, uh, of, of, you know, Harar al-Sham and all the, you know, these little Al-Qaeda clone groups um, who obviously aren't operating as independent journalists, but that's what they're calling themselves. And so these, these reporters in Beirut at the New York Times and at the Washington Post and all of these, you know, major publications are just repeating what they're hearing. And then the other issue is the government, you know, the Syrian government made it very difficult for Western journalists to visit because that wasn't their primary concern. The Syrian government's primary concern was the narrative that, that the domestic audience was hearing. They didn't really care what the international community was talking about, right? They were fighting an existential fight against ISIS, Al Qaeda, and a bunch of groups that are just like them. Um, and so, you know, the, the lack of access to both sides left these Western reporters, you know, dependent on one side that was giving them, you know, fa a false portrayal of what was happening. And then that's what you were hearing. But that, that said, you know, I, I've been to government areas of Syria and I've actually gone to both Damascus and West Aleppo before the government took back East Aleppo with uh, Western correspondents with like from major publications. And we saw the same things like we saw the same devastation. We saw the same stuff, but they didn't report on it accurately because they also have a bias. Like you don't, you know, th there's like a level of like um, of self censorship that exists at mainstream media outlets, but there's also a level of bias. And the reason that you do get to be a reporter for these major outlets is because you have a certain ideology that's in line. Like it's not stated that way, but that's why you get promotions, right? You get promotions because you report things with a narrative that matches the State Department, you know? And that's, we've seen people literally get fired. We saw Chris Hedges got fired from the New York Times because he opposed the Iraq war. Um, yeah. People get pushed out of their jobs when they criticize Israel, but they get promoted when they offer a narrative that goes, so there's like a sort of opportunistic side of it. But then there's also like, I think with the Syrian war, um, they're really, you know, because of journalists just talking to these activists, they like became close with them and they developed like an emotional attachment. 
to these these people who were pushing for like a sect a disgusting sectarian agenda but it's almost like they didn't even care and you know but, sorry go ahead yeah, you no know, but, but 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 that's but that's very interesting because uh because because you exposed on uh, in in your investigations, you showed a clip of Al Jazeera Arabic, uh, Al Jazeera Arabic, where all these guys were were were, were talking about an Alawites uh, Alawites committing genocide in Sunnis, and their response, their literal response is, well, we need to actually wipe out the Alawites, and we actually mm -hmm. we should just wipe out all non-Sunnis in Syria, literally saying that. So that means- Yeah, I think what you're, I think what you're talking about, there was, it was like one of the biggest watch talk show programs on Al Jazeera Arabic at the time. I can't remember the name of the presenter, but the, it, the title of the segment was, should we kill all Alawites? Or like, it was like something really explicit and genocidal like that. And that's what's so funny about Al Jazeera Arabic because, you know, Al Jazeera English is perceived in the Western world as like this kind of progressive, uh, outlet that has like a progressive line and it kind of does it's like a liberal progressive line but oh my god Al Jazeera Arabic was just like genocide TV during the war in Syria but, 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 but that but that's said Miss Colic because because you because because you speak Arabic Manar Adli speaks uh, Arabic and some of the contributors of Mempress News speak Arabic a lot of these people from these Gulf funded Muslim civil rights groups in Britain and the US and Canada they all speak Arabic too, so that they being know what's said, being said, so are they? they so are they? So, so 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 that being said, they must be watching Al Jazeera Arabic and so forth and going, holy shit, this is actually a sectarian, uh, a Gulf Western backed war on Syria. But why are they still then supporting the balkanization and destruction of Syria? Does that basically just expose that 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 much of these expat communities are basically you know, you know, Sunni so, sectarians. So I think, yeah. So I, th I think this is, this is, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think that um, there's a couple things going on here. What's happened in recent years uh, because of this sort of Sunni victimization complex that's been pushed yeah, yeah. And talk since about the that. beginning talk of the Arab, well. the beginning of the Arab spring, um, the Gulf funded media, as well as U S media and Western media pushed this idea of Sunni victimization across the Middle East. And so I will tell you, like, there's people I used to be friends with. I mean, unfortunately, we're not friends anymore because of the Arab Spring and they couldn't deal with our differing political opinions. But I never, ever, ever saw them identify as like Sunni. Like, that was never a thing. They're like secular Arabs in the West. But because of the rhetoric and propaganda coming out of the Arab Spring, of specifically what was happening in Syria and then later Iraq, they really like uh, internalized that Sunni victimization complex. And Assad's, Assad is killing Sunnis. Assad is genociding Sunnis. Hezbollah's genocide. Iran wants to kill all Sunnis. I, my family's Sunni. So some people, not everyone, there's not like a one explanation for this, but some people really internalized that victimization complex and went with it. Uh, other people, um, you know, they come from elite families, elite Syrian families, for example, who have, you know, um, a bad history with the Assads or the Ba'athists because, yeah. you know, they were from elite landowning families and their land was taken away uh, in like redistributive policies. And they're still angry about that, right? It's mu very, very similar to like Cuban exiles in Miami who fled when Castro took over because they were landowners or factory owners or like plantation owners and they want their ship back, right? They want their stuff back. And you know, and then there's also the mentality of like the exiles who think that if they can just get rid of the current regime, they are the ones who get to take over. They're the ones who are going to be in power. So there's a lot of different dynamics going on here. And then there is a sectarian side of it, right? There are groups that have, you know, that that do have a sectarian agenda because of their politics. There's certain Syrian American groups in the U.S. who have a very sectarian agenda. I wouldn't say they're like Al Qaeda but they do have a Sunni supremacist agenda and that's what they wanted to see implemented in Syria. And to them, in their minds, having, like I even heard people say, I'd rather have Al Qaeda take over than have Assad in power, right? So like, it's like that, that mentality exists because of that. And then there's just opportunists. There's also opportunists. You can social climb to high positions in think tanks and in the media world if you allow yourself to be a weaponized immigrant who speaks the language of imperialism,
and you know, just uh, repeats and echoes the State Department talking points because you're useful then because then you can go and say, well, from my personal experience, and so there's, there's a level of opportunism there as well. So I don't think it's like a one explanation. I think it's kind of a mix of all of those things. Um, and I've met people, you know, that, that all of those things apply to. But it's, but, 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 but it's shocking because, uh, and this, this is a good segue to, 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 to why I'm so baffled on the left, is that, you know, you have, there, there, there's a worthy victim an unworthy victim that's happening on the left. So the Yemenis who are oppressed by a, a, a Western Gulf backed war are worthy victims. And so they get solidarity protests and people speaking out on that. But Syria, which is a Western Gulf, Turkish and Israeli war on a secular sovereign non-sectarian government it's an unworthy victim, and mm. uh, and 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 I know for and 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 I've you know I've 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 followed you know the ongo you know the saga that you dealt with where where you were fired, uh, you were subjected to a vicious, vicious smear campaign. Uh, Max Blumenthal, luckily enough, is is you know you know has enough of a, a, a of a popular defense that you know it you know it kind of went over his head but you literally lost your job and, and so forth so so yeah so so any reflections on that because it because it's it's just mind baffling that once upon a time we went from people even if they hated communism protesting against the Vietnam war people right. said no war for oil in Iraq and 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 Iraq, that was a Baathist secular government, slightly more sectarian than the Syrian one. But on Syria and Venezuela, there is no no war for oil in Venezuela or Syria. It's all like, yeah, let, you know, let you know, you know, let the country, you know, burn to the ground. And I and I, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and we support these these fake anarcho syndicalists of Kurds and all this and just all this other bullshit. And it's just. And anyways, it's it's mind baffling, and I and I want like so a reflection. I think I think like a couple things there. I think that the um, there's been a concerted, well-funded effort to smear, right? The the whole what you just described it happened to me, right? I lost my job. I was viciously like smeared and libeled and called like a genocide apologist, and I lost friends. And you know, for a while, people wouldn't like associate with me because if people lie about you enough. If they say about you enough, you support genocide, you support genocide. If somebody tweets that enough times, eventually people are going to be like, my God, she must support genocide. Like all these people are saying, you know, I don't even know the details, but the, you know, that sticks. Other people see that as a message. They see that as if you speak out on this issue, you will be viciously smeared and your livelihood will be attacked. Your, your ability to like make money and put a roof over your head will may, might be destroyed. And so it's, it's meant to both smear the messenger, but also to act as like a warning to anybody else who may want to speak out on this issue. And so I think that that has been very effective because I know there's a lot of people who understand the issue of Syria who've read my work, but they won't share it because they don't want to get attacked. But doing that on Yemen doesn't get you attacked. Because the U.S. isn't as invested in destroying Yemen. I mean, Yemen, the Saudis are invested in destroying Yemen. And the U.S. is kind of just like continuing to go along with it because they'll do whatever Saudi Arabia wants. But at the same time, in the long term, you know, the war in Yemen doesn't actually give the U.S. anything strategically. It's really just like a, destroying a people. Whereas the war in Syria, the U.S. was much more deeply involved with. The U.S. is still involved with, and the U.S. sees a long-term strategy of wanting to overthrow this government. And so, like, there and, and you know, people forget the role of think tanks. These fake experts who work at these, you know, NATO and State Department and weapons company funded think tanks, like the Atlantic yeah. Council, and you know, all of their clones. Um, these people, like, their job is also to smear and. You know, I think that this also comes out of the 80s. In the 80s, the U.S., you know, I, I, would, I think Syria is more similar to what the U.S. did in the 80s in Latin America with a dirty war by, like, arming and funding Contras. I think that that's kind of, like, what happened. Or what by, happened with by, by overly demonizing Daniel Ortega, Sandinista right. government as, like, right. a brutal Marxist DPRK type of regime. Which, 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 of course, is complete that, bullshit. That, but right, of course, but that, but that did 
there was fighting on the left over that. Like, should we support the Sandinistas? No, they're authoritarian. There were similar arguments. But that was over Marxist figures. When it comes to places like Syria, it's much more gray because the, the Syrian government isn't leftist, right? It's like, you know, Ba'athists aren't leftists. They're not like, so it's, it's not so much about like defending a leftist government as it is defending a country from this kind of imperial invasion by Contras. Um, and so I, I think that like they're, they're, the US kind of learned its lesson from the 80s and went even harder. And also you have to understand there's also not as many, the, the, the US left is much weaker on foreign policy because so much of it has been co-opted, right? By academia and in journalism. And you're NGOs so weird, well. like NGOs. NGO, and the NGO, the NGOization of, of like leftism as well has taken a huge toll where people end up in the NGO pipeline and like they end up adopting that, that ideology of human rights, you know, the whole, the U.S. has weaponized the issue of human rights quite effectively as well. And so all of these things together have just confused the left. And then they don't know where they stand and they throw up their arms. This is too complicated. I can't understand it. Or, you know, the other issue is with the current, with, with the PKK, with the YPG. There was a concerted propaganda campaign to get Western leftists to support, you know, I will say this, the YPG wasn't interested in collapsing the Syrian government. They were interested in fighting ISIS and also taking over as much territory as they could so they could have like an area to be in charge with because ultimately they're Kurdish nationalists and they want their own, um, which is a project that I don't think is leftist at all. And I don't think they're leftist and they actually behave more like a cult, but that's a story for another day. But there was a deliberate propaganda effort to woo Western leftists towards this, like, and it was so fake. It was like, oh, look at these women revolutionaries. Like, they're like fighting on the front lines against ISIS and they're anti fascist anarchists. And it's like, no, I mean, the YPG is just the Syrian PKK. They have a weird cultish ideology and like they don't have sex. Like, and there's like, if they're in the fighting wars, they don't have sex. Like, it's like, and they're also like imposing themselves on areas of the, of Syria that aren't even Kurdish. They're like, and they want to impose Kurdish nationalism, yeah. like, not leftism. Yeah. Oh, and uh -oh. yeah. Actually, wait, uh, one second. Oh, Ryan. what happened? We're, yeah, we're, we're having a bit of some uh, internet connections, but okay, I, I think it's all good again. All good? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, but yeah, but basically, but yeah, but but but, but when it comes to like the Kurds, uh, you actually uh, exposed uh, how how these supposedly victimized, you know, Kurds in Iraq actually uh, were complicit or certainly allowed ISIS to do a brutal genocide against the, uh, you know, Yazidis. So Lord knows what's happening with the Western right, that's acts. The, that's, the, that's the other thing that the West, Western leftists don't understand. Maybe some of them do, but the Kurds aren't all united. There's different factions of Kurds, right? The YPG in Syria... It's at complete odds, and they're way better than like the Barzani uh, Kurds in uh, northern Iraq. Um, and then there's other groups among those, like the Kurds in Iraq aren't all united. There's different parties, uh, and you know the I'm like there's so many acronyms. I'm I'm kind of blanking on them right now because I wasn't expecting to talk about the different. <laughs> no Kurdish worries, groups. no but worries. I have, I mean, I've, but you've seen the articles I've written about this, and yeah, the Peshmerga, which is like the Kurdish army of one of the. Uh, most authoritarian political parties, Kurdish parties in northern Iraq, they were like the, the if you talk to Yazidis, they will actually tell you it's the Peshmerga's fault that ISIS swept through our area. So like the Kurds are not all united in what they want and what they envision. And that's something that I think that like that like American leftists don't get is they talk because there's American leftists who really support the Kurdish project for a nation. And I'm like, actually, the Kurds in Turkey are Turkish. The Kurds in Syria are culturally Syrian. Like, yeah, they speak Kurdish and maybe have some like similar like similarities here and there, but they're culturally Syrian. They even have their own Syrian Kurdish dialect. And then in Iraq, there's like different uh, Kurds with different dialects but they're also culturally pretty much Iraqi. And like, you want to make a nation out of that? It doesn't even make sense to me. Like you literally want to take land away from all these different countries and make a nation of people who don't have that much in common aside from maybe a language that like they can't even actually understand each other 
because their dialects are so different. But like you can't, you know, Western leftists don't always understand that sort of nuance because they are being specifically propagandized to support that project. Well, one last bit, but 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 then, but then, but then a quick follow up then about the Kurds. But isn't it safe to say that uh, you know you, you know that we need to not only abandon this sort of this this sort of Kurdish ethno nationalist project, uh, uh, but we also need to then abandon you know pan Arabism and actually embrace uh, what I what I, what I think should be called pan Middle Easternism secular pan middle easternism shouldn't we be supporting that because because when we talk about the muslim world and when we talk about the arab no, world we're, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know we're you know we're completely then you know completely pushing aside christian communities and jewish communities and mm. communist communities and, and you know and so forth and it's and 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 then this this vicious cycle of of you know choosing between between the extreme Sunnism of a Qatar and a Saudi Arabia or a Shia nationalism of Ayatollah Khomeini and, you know, and Hezbollah. Although Hezbollah, you know, is also, it's a bit oversimplistic to say that about Hezbollah, which, which we won't get into, but, but then shouldn't, but then shouldn't allies, uh, you know, Middle Eastern solidarity activists and anti-imperialists, shouldn't we be propping up a secular pan Middle Easternist project as opposed to, Oh, it has to be either, you know, Kurdish nationhood or pan-Arabism. Yeah, it's not an either or. And I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the Middle East has been, especially over the last 20 years, but longer, has been really devastated and destroyed. And there's just so much that needs to be, like, recovered and rebuilt. I mean, whether you're talking about Libya or Syria or Iraq. I mean, Iraq has experienced like four, three to four decades of just constant trauma um, that's destroyed the fabric of its society, that there isn't even anything to support, really. Like, there's not big yeah. movements. There's just like, a, you know, like little bits and shards of a country trying to get by of what's left of it. Yeah, um, and exactly. that's what you see in large parts. That's what you see in large parts of the Middle East. And so I think that what American and Western leftists, their priority should be the U.S. needs to get out. U.S. imperialism has destroyed this region. You know, global, the global north has destroyed this region. Get out and pay reparations. I mean, that's in an ideal world. <laughs> I know it's yep. not going to happen, but that that's what needs to happen. And it's not really us to say, like, I mean, I, of course, have, have my vision for what I'd like to see the Middle East be. I'd like to see it be a united region that can, like, work together to have its own economy. And like, you know, have its different develop, you know, have its different productive sectors. And, and, you know, but that said, like, I think at the end of the day, it's like up to the people there to figure it out. And it's up to us as leftists who have control to some degree over yeah. our governments, or at least we have a voice, right, to some degree over the people listening us to advocate for like, it's not up to us. It's not our choice or decision. We're actually the problem. We're supporting the worst actors in the region and we're making it a place that's unlivable. And that needs to stop. Um, yeah. And only only once you, like, it's like, it's, it's a place where there's almost no space for movements. You know, for there's like, it's, when you look across the Middle East, the left has been completely decimated. Like it's un, unlike Latin America, Left in the Middle East is almost non-existent. I mean, the biggest anti-imperialist groups in the Middle East, my anti-imperialists, I mean, I just mean that those that are pretty, that are dedicated to fighting U.S. and Israeli and Gulf state hegemony in the region are like these religious Shia groups, basically, Hezbollah, Iran, you know. Um, and maybe as leftists, that's not exactly like our ideal for what we want to see, because we're not, you know, leftists typically are against, you know, religious religion mixing with state. But at the same time, it's just not up to us. Like we have to get out because we're the ones causing the problems, you know, and so it's then, like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So then, you know, it kind of, you know, it's, you know, it kind of reminds me, like, I, I never understood the, the, the deep pathological derangement syndrome against Tulsi uh, Gabbard. I know she's not perfect on every single issue, but I thought that she was a much better socialist reformist at home and anti-imperialist abroad who could appeal to, you know, libertarian anti-imperialists and people of a military background who also are tired of, 
of these of, of these imperial wars, and yet so much of those uh, of the left of, of left leaning folk, uh, and and well, I guess what the World Socialist website would call the pseudo left, what Black Agenda Report would call the Black Misleadership class, were just all vicious in their hostility towards Tulsi Gabbard when when. When I'm sorry, guys, Bernie Sanders, yeah, he's great on the domestic front, but he, but, but he, yeah, he's, they gave, they gave a total so pass. Sees. They and gave AOC, a total and pass. Ilhan Omar and so forth. They all get passes, right? They all get passes, but Tulsi Gabbard isn't perfect on everything, so we can't be supportive of her, of, of her being the only congressperson who is speaking out against the war in Syria. Listen, I would love to continue on, but I, I like I told you about why this time I do have to run. Um, All right. I'd love to do this again sometime. This was like a really yes. great conversation. Oh well, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, okay. Well, 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 we'll be in touch and we'll try to organize a follow-up interview. So, yeah. uh, so comrades on this edition of one plus one, we were joined by, uh, Rania Kalik. I'm going to link to a huge body of her work, mm -hmm. her link trees and, and the different, uh, media outlets that she's a uh, part of, uh, Ms. Kalik. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank I you. really appreciate it. And I really hope that we get the chance to uh, talk soon because there are some other issues which I also wanted to uh, bitch <laughs> about. But yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. And best of luck with everything. I'm really happy that, 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 thing, that things are turning around for you in the uh, journalism, truth telling departments, right? Thank you. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. They definitely are. And I feel really lucky because of that. But I do have to, I'm so sorry to like All rush right, off. Perfect. I just, I have to go, go get in the car. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Ciao.